in terms of potassium, we hear some people kind of fear potassium and supplementing with potassium. Can you chat about that a little bit? Like, can you actually overdose on a potassium supplement? When uh, lethal injections are administered, it's actually a form a form of highly concentrated potassium because it causes mm -hmm. the heart to cramp and and that's it. And so the interesting flip side of that is if we overconsume sodium, the kidneys are really, really good at sorting out that problem. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes for most people. And the, the kidneys will filter out the excess sodium, uh, put that into the urine. And it's relatively easy to deal with an excess sodium problem, whereas an excess potassium problem can be legitimately dan uh, dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Today's episode is with Rob Wolf. Rob Wolf is a former research biochemist and two-time New York Times and Wall Street Journal best-selling author of The Paleo Solution and Wired to Eat. Rob has transformed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people around the world via his top rank iTunes podcasts, books, and seminars. He's known for his direct approach and ability to distill and synthesize information to make the complicated stuff easier to understand. So in today's episode, we chat about Rob's personal journey through paleo, keto, and low carb, and how it's evolved over the years. We also chat about Rob's experience with keto and higher intensity training like CrossFit, as well as dive into his opinions on metabolic flexibility. And of course, we chat about one of Rob's favorite topics, electrolytes. So I know you're going to take a lot away from this episode and really enjoy it. So let's get right into it with Rob Wolf. Welcome back to Metflex and Chill. This is your host, Rachel Gregory, and I'm here with Rob Wolf. What's up, Rob? How are you? All good. Good to see you. I'm glad you're here. I'm really excited to chat with you about a bunch of different topics. Um, I know we were just talking off air how we have, I have so many topics I want to talk to you about. So we'll see um, what we can get to in this hour-ish time. Um, but for anybody who doesn't know, do you want to just start off by kind of telling us who you are, how you got into this whole nutrition thing, <laughs> and how you've kind of evolved to where you're at today? Yeah, I'll try to keep it really brief and just kind of 30,000 foot level, but I, I have an undergrad in biochemistry, was looking at either medical school or uh, research, you know, PhD track in autoimmunity or cancer. Uh, along that way, I developed ulcerative colitis uh, to a degree that I was facing a, a bowel resection or immunosuppressant drugs. I'm about 165 pounds right now. My low ebb on ulcerative colitis, was, I was about 125, 130 pounds. So if you imagine 30 pounds less of me, like it was pretty, pretty dire. And the, how I got to a paleo diet as, as a solution to that is a long story. I'll have to kind of curtail that it's in my books and, and everything, but this idea got on my radar. I tried it because it was desperate. It seemed insane. But also it, it, it kind of made some sense when I started thinking about the evolutionary biology of stuff. And so a 23 years ago, I started tinkering with a low carb paleo type diet and it, it is shockingly improved my digestive health. I had some autoimmune related issues that have largely resolved since then. Uh, I went on to co-found the first and fourth CrossFit affiliate gyms in the world. And so it was early in the CrossFit scene, uh, paleo and CrossFit kind of lived and died in, in lockstep with one another. I've done work with Naval Special Warfare, police, military, fire, but really my my passion has been working with people who have complex health issues, who have run the gamut of conventional medicine and it's failed them. And they have autoimmune gut metabolic issues. Uh, they're kind of the, you know, they're looking for the Island of, of misfit toys and I'm, I'm, I'm it like I'm, <laughs> I'm the kind of the end of the road for, for those folks. And I love working with those people because I, I feel like that is so much my story and very much my, my wheelhouse and, and, Although it's awesome to work with athletes and, and hard chargers, I don't, I mean, I'm not going to make or break their, their career really, but if somebody is dying from an autoimmune condition and we can change their diet and lifestyle in a meaningful way, it could literally save their life, alter the course of their family and whatnot. So that's really mm -hmm. been my, my passion throughout this whole thing. I love it. I love it. 
Um, so yeah, I definitely want to dive into a few things that you mentioned. Um, but I guess my first question would be, and this is a question I, I asked some of my listeners if they had questions, and this is one that I've got a bunch of kind of in different ways, but they asked, and it's, a, it's kind of a loaded question, how your views have evolved maybe over the past, say, like six, seven years within keto becoming very popular, um, paleo keto becoming very popular, and kind of how, you know, you know, you implement it yourself and with your clients and how you maybe your views have changed or is there like one or two specific things that you thought was maybe optimal a few years ago and mm -hmm. now you're just like, ah, uh, maybe not. <laughs> right, right. You, you know, so it's interesting if folks look back at my first book, it was very protein centric. It put a, it, and it was the, the paleo solution. Uh, very protein centric. It recommended in the beginning a cap of 50 grams of effective carbohydrate per day, and then eat to eat fat to satiety. And my base recommendations really haven't changed a ton other than I think I've become ever more aware that the folks that are struggling with um, body composition, appetite, you know, control, uh, metabolic issues, that protein really is the thing to focus on. Um, I, I think within keto diet land, we had a period of time where it was like, uh, avoid protein, it's gonna cause mTOR, mTOR will cause your penis or your ovaries to fly off your body and you will die immediately, you know? And, 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 uh, and we just couldn't have been more wrong. Like a, a big swath of the ketogenic diet scene was, worse than raw vegans in their, their protein avoidance. I, I mean, literally like the, you would look at the recommendations that people were making and they were recommending l less than 35 grams of protein per day for a grown female. And if you follow the, the durian writer guy, the 30 bananas a day guy, if you eat 30 bananas a day, you at least get 40 grams of protein <laughs> a day. You know, I mean, it, it's yeah. like, so, you know, and over the course of time, as we started doing some, some like resets within the, the healthy rebellion community that I have folks that have followed me for 10, 15 years, you know, and, and they, they like my work, they've had benefit, but they, they had still struggled significantly with either performance or body composition or, or some other issues. When we actually weighed and measured their food, they were oftentimes like 50% under eating protein. And so mm -hmm. I've just become kind of protein crazy. And then I guess over the course of time, I've softened a bit on, on my carbohydrate stance, like uh, 2002, 2003, I was definitely in the, the insulin hypothesis camp. It's still really perplexing to me because me personally, I swear to God, and like, I, I would, I would die in front of Lane Norton saying this, like <laughs> I get chubby on carbs and I swear to God, I, I calorie match, but they, they don't seem to be metabolically equal in my body. But when I look at all of the re research, it's like, well, either I'm doing something wrong or this ever growing body of research is wrong. And so it's like, that's where I've got to not put my personal experience. I, I, I will say, well, I have better appetite control on, mm -hmm. on this and people will, will give it a, a pass. But, um, you know, my, my, stink eye towards carbohydrates has softened. I do still think that they're a major, um, kind of like a control rod in a nuclear reactor. Like if you want things to go a particular way, uh, I feel like they really control things in a remarkable fashion, specifically with regards to appetite. Mm -hmm. And let's face it also, whether you're in that, like carbs cause obesity or fat causes obesity, the bulk of the foods that are fat carb combos, pizza, processed foods, that is super dangerous. So when we start mm -hmm. sticking those two in combination in highly processed format, then, you know, that's a problem. So I guess, uh, you know, very protein centric, I've softened my stance on, on carbohydrates, although I, I see them being very powerful in appetite control when so long as protein is controlled another biggie. Um, mm -hmm. those are probably the, the, the big ones that, that, you, you know, I've either changed or, or refined over, over the last six years. Yeah, for sure. I love it. I, I feel like I'm in the same camp there with protein and, 
and carbs. And obviously the show is called Metflex and Chill. So I'm all about right. metabolic flexibility um, and kind of that being in my eyes, the end goal for a lot of people who are just looking right. to get healthy and, you know, use the full spectrum of their metabolism um, to their advantage. Right. So I guess my question, one of my questions for you around the topic of metabolic flexibility is we talk about, um, and this is something that I used to talk about a lot too, like getting metabolically flexible, you know, you had to go through a ketogenic diet and become fat adapted and train your body to, to use ketones for fuel again, right? Because most people haven't done that since they were born. Um, but we do see with keto evolving over the last years that a lot of people have gone very strict keto to kind of the other side of the spectrum where they basically downrate regulate their ability to use carbs effectively. So with in your opinion and in your practice, have you seen um, this kind of metabolic inflexibility on both sides of the spectrum? Um, and what would you say in that regard for for how to kind of mitigate that or or your opinion just in that on that in general? Yeah, you the way you couch that is going to be 10 times better than my answer. Like I should, you should <laughs> not say anything you you couch that beautifully so i want to say it was like eight years ago i and, and after the show remind me i'll send you this this file i have but it, it's a a file with a bunch of stuff in it and it's called the metflex certification and so i was wow. going to create a health coaching platform i had been noodling on a health coaching platform for a long time but i was like metabolic flexibility is it. It is the holy grail. It is the Rosetta Stone. It's all this stuff. But then as I started digging into it, I was like, how the fuck do you get it? You know, it's <laughs> like, you can get lean, um, doing, you know, uh, some fasting, some fasted training, some ketogenic diet stuff. But what's interesting about becoming keto adapted is it seems like there's a really powerful immediate ramp up in keto adaptation, you know, the first maybe three months, but then long-term there seems to be other benefits to the ketogenic diet. And a lot of like what Finney and Volick and, and some of the anti-aging stuff looks at, it really paints like, you know, say like a HDAC inhibition and, and the loss of telomere length and stuff. You want that signal to exist over a long period of time. But while you're in that state, you're not metabolically flexible. You're kind of in a fat centric cul-de-sac unless you do some things like very targeted carbohydrate in and around hard training and stuff like that. But then is that really metabolic flexibility or are you, just, you know, it's a, like, are you goosing it just because you're cranking the engine up? And so I honestly kind of abandoned the, the topic in a lot of ways because I saw people like my wife who are metabolically flexible. She's pretty lean. Um, she can eat carbs and be fine. She can go ketogenic and she doesn't suffer the keto flu. And she, she has zero experience of like differences in cognition, physical performance. She was a 13th place CrossFit games finisher a, a number of years ago. The only thing that I could do to my wife to change her situation is to break her metabolically. Like I can't, I, I don't know what I would do to make her more meta metabolically flexible. And I do think in a lot of ways that should be the human default norm. I don't think that doing ketosis should be like hitting a brick wall and then you've got to like climb your way through it and everything. I think that that is kind of a sign of some amount of loss of metabolic flexibility, but we, we lift weights, we do low level cardio, we do high intensity cardio, we sleep well, we time restrict. And then I'm not <laughs> sure what else happens there, you know, but, but you kind of only get what you get out of that. I'm never going to be as metabolically flexible as what my wife is like I, and this is part of the thing that caused me to throw my hands up on this topic a little bit. It, it's kind of like, damn straight metabolic flexibility is what you want, but I'm not, to, you know, other than, you, you know, you lift some weights, you, you're, you're not overweight. Um, you, you cycle things a little bit, but your mm -hmm. my sense is you're going to kind of get what you're going to get. And we're not going to be able to create necessarily with, with all people, these really broadly metabolically flexible 
folks, um, I think a little bit about the Kenyan uh, runners where they like a 70% carbohydrate diet, but they do a fair amount of their, their low intensity cardio fasted. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about those folks is even though they eat a mainly carbohydrate diet, they do a fair amount of their cardio fasted. And when they've done respiratory quotient analysis on those people, those folks, they're mainly burning fat during that low intensity activity. Now, when they do a marathon, it's an under two hour event. It's almost purely glycogen fueled because they're running so ungodly fast, even though it's 26 miles, they're doing, you know, like five minute mile paces practically. Like it, it's the running mm -hmm. both stunningly fast and for a long time, but they're, they're able to do it quickly enough that they don't deplete their glycogen reserves, which is really interesting, but they are metabolically flexible, but they're not tackling it from the fat centric side first. It's almost like we'll, we'll do fasted training. We'll do aerobic based cardio. They are not insulin resistant. So they have no problem accessing body fat for energy. So, mm -hmm. it, it, so it, you see what I mean? Like your question was so much better than my answer. Like, I feel <laughs> like it, it just becomes this like Rorschach blot. Like I'm not entirely sure what to make of it right now, other than having it as an orienting feature and then thinking about, well, what can we do to tweak this in different ways? But mm -hmm. I'm also kind of at a spot where if people are really benefiting from a gut perspective from a neurological perspective, uh, uh, I think maybe even from some potential anti-aging benefits and they're in a, an appropriate protein ketogenic diet, they may not be that metabolically flexible, but it may not be that important also. And I do think there's also the reality that like, it, you know, I do Brazilian jiu-jitsu. If I have a, a really hard training session, I'll just drop carbs in right at that training session. And then it facilitates the training session. I don't suffer deleterious effects downstream. And then I'm, I'm kind of off and running from there. So I know yeah. that that was like all over the place. And I don't <laughs> know that it was a particularly good answer, but that that's where I'm at now. Like eight years ago, I felt so cocksure that I understood this. And now it, it just, yeah. it's, it's an enigma to me. It's a total enigma. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, that's literally why I started this podcast because I wanted to have, you know, experts on and people on from all different camps and, you know, ex experienced all different things and worked with different types of people. And really, like you said, maybe there's no way to actually reach that full metabolic flexibility, but striving for that and, you know, putting things in place and trying different things out. I mean, at the end of the day, like you said, it just comes back to the individual person, what their goals are, right. you know, what they, what their history is, what their metab metabolic health is, all of that. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you hit on it. I think that really, in my opinion, you know, the goal is to strive for it. Right. But who knows, you know, for each individual. Um, so yeah, but I also like that you said you brought up the exercise component of it too, because I feel like a lot of people are so focused on just like, oh, you have to, you know, it's either carbs or fats or whatever it may be, but there's, there's also that activity component. There's also, you mm -hmm. know, stress and sleep and all of those things play into how, you know, your, your body works, right. And how, how optimized you can be in that sense. Um, so yeah, I, it's, it was a hard question. I think you, I think you answered it very well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I do want to chat a little bit about moving on to kind of performance and chatting a little bit about CrossFit. Um, so I did, we did talk off air. So I did the study in, uh, looking at a ketogenic diet and non-elite CrossFit athletes, um, years ago, that's kind of what propelled me into this space. And, you know, there's a lot of pushback with keto and CrossFit. Um, I always preface that the study that I did was in non-elite CrossFit athletes, kind of just your average Joe, you know, 90% of people who go into a CrossFit gym and just want to get a good workout in, get that, you know, atmosphere. Um, so what's your opinion with implementing and, and just your views on implementing a, you know, a lower carb protocol within a CrossFit setting for those people who are actually not like the elite of the elite, just like your 90% of the people who actually go to CrossFit on a daily basis. Yeah. And, you know, even in the elite of the elite, I think something that gets missed in this story is what constitutes a ketogenic diet. You, you, you kind of alluded to this in our, our last topic, which was the exercise piece is really, really important. So if I'm training really hard, my macronutrient composition can be shockingly different 
and still be ketogenic. You know, if, if I'm super hard charging, so like uh, Sami Ainkainen, who uh, he's a tech founder of Trulia, cashed out of that for a lot of money. And then he's a co-founder of Verta Health. He did a study where, study of one, but he did uh, these uh, six hour, it, it's a bicycle race. I forget, it, the, it, it's like these stage races where, you know, one person will go like crazy and they get to a spot and then they tag team out and then they ride slow. And it, it, I forget, but it, it's, um, he, he had to consume something like 6,000 calories a day to, to just maintain on this, this thing. And he was eating more than 200 grams of carbs per day. And he was still at like a two, 2.5 beta hydroxybutyrate. So I think that where this goes south, and this is oftentimes, this is where I really see this thing fall apart for folks in the CrossFit scene. They'll see a story of somebody who is 100 pounds over, overweight. They go on a ketogenic diet, lose a massive amount of weight, get, get down it, it to a reasonable body fat level. And then I think it's <clears throat> easy to assume, well, I only want to lose like five pounds of fat. So if a ketogenic diet helped a person lose a hundred pounds of fat, surely it'll help me lose this <laughs> last five pounds of fat. And that's not necessarily the case. And particularly even within performance athletics, like, uh, the leanness, the figure competitors is oftentimes completely antagonistic to the leanness of an Olympic wrestler or a CrossFit gamer. Like they're lean, but they're not always like figure competitor lean. So I think there's, you know, that, that is a piece to this. So this hard charging person in a CrossFit setting, whether they're elite level or, or just recreational, they go on a prescribed ketogenic diet, 30 grams of carbs a day. And the, but they, the, but they're doing a work output that would support being still in ketosis at 150, 200 grams of carbs a day. They're still technically keto fueled. They're still getting enough glycogen to be metabolically flexible, to dip into that whole glycolytic pathway, which is 80% of what CrossFit is about. And so that's actually kind of an example of some, you know, some thinking around metabolic flexibility, but I think the, the wheels really fall off the wagon at not recognizing that what constitutes ketosis could be significantly higher carbohydrate levels. Now let's contrast that though, with what American council of sports medicine would, would recommend for these people for like a 200 pound male, they would be recommending 600 to 800 grams of carbs per day. So these folks are maybe finding that they do great on 200 grams of carbs per day. Their sleep is better. They have, when they do their cardio based events, they're mainly fat and, and ketone fueled. So, so, uh, they're not digging into their glycogen storage for, for these lower level activities. So they're doing fuel partitioning and all that type of stuff, um, lower inflammation, better recovery, but they're not eating a, a, uh, 30 gram capped ketogenic diet. I think that that's mm -hmm. a big deal. Another huge deal. And I, I forget whether or not y'all controlled for this, but I think electrolytes are huge in the story and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I'm part of this company element and everything, but it had to have been 2004, maybe 2005. I was having a discussion with Greg Glassman and he was talking about how when folks did this, this modified zone diet, which was adequate protein, kind of low carb, like it was about 150 grams of, of carbs per day. And then it was about a 60% fat diet beyond that, you know? So it was this really interesting kind of kind of middle ground in that whole story. But he, he said to me, he's like, Rob, if, if people don't get at least five grams of sodium per day, their performance tanks, mm -hmm. their sleep gets disturbed. They don't have a low gear. They start overtraining. And I remembered him saying that. And I, I always, you know, I salted my food pretty aggressively and everything, but I, I, it took me another 20 years almost to figure <laughs> out that I, I was probably shockingly under consuming sodium. So I think that that adequate sodium intake is possibly as important or maybe even more important than the carbohydrate itself. Like I would be really interested to go back and look at folks and make sure that they get adequate sodium. And then maybe they can even run at that somewhat lower carbohydrate level, you know, like 50 grams a day. Although I, I, I don't know necessarily what the need is, but what would be interesting is to see how much of the performance decline, the overreaching, overtraining, 
would be mitigated by simply getting adequate sodium in, mm-hmm. in the process of their, their training and, and, and all that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's super important. And I think that's something that like, there's a lot of things that are missed within that. Cause we think, you know, it's just, everybody's kind of looking at the broad view. Oh, CrossFit is such a highly glycolytic sport. So you need carbs. And it's like, well, it's not as simple as that. And there's different things, especially within CrossFit and within the different types of workouts. I mean, when I was going to CrossFit, we would do like, it was an hour session and it was 50 minutes of the session was just strict strength skill work. Right. Right. And then maybe like the last five to 10 minutes was the Metcon. And so a lot of people don't realize that too. Um, well, it, and when you, when we look critically at a properly keto adapted individual, like they're into it three months, they are not lower in muscle glycogen than a, a glycogen fueled athlete uh, via gluconeogenesis, breaking down some protein, breaking down the glycerol backbone of, of, uh, uh fatty acids, um, they end up repleting glycogen. So they are not specifically glycogen depleted. Now that said, I do think that, um, some targeted carbohydrate can go a long ways towards uh, fooling the central governor, the part of the brain that is looking at ener- energy allocation. Um, I think that putting some targeted carbohydrates amidst a CrossFit type workout can improve performance, but it's not really happening at a metabolic level. It's more of a central governor brain level because they've, they've done the studies where they will run people to exhaustion on a treadmill and then they will uh, do the same study where they allow people to rinse their mouth with a, a sweet tasting, but non-nutritive, uh, you know, uh, beverage, mm-hmm. and they get five to 8% more performance out of that. Just because the brain is thinking we got a little bit of nutrition. We have a little bit of energy, even though they don't. And the brain would mitigate some of the senses of fatigue and, and shutting down muscle activity. So I think that there's there's a lot of different levels to, to that whole, whole story mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I completely agree. Do you think there's a difference with, um, in terms of like genders with, you know, maybe a woman in this situation who's wants to, who's doing CrossFit, you know, wants to implement a low carb or keto diet versus a male? In theory, when we look at this stuff, women are better at fat mobilization than men are. And so in some ways you could make the argument that um, women should be better at, at, at doing this. And I've seen both ends of the following kind of spectrum or story. I, I see women who are calorie deficient, carb deficient, o- o- potentially over tra- training, like getting into that female athlete triad kind of mm-hmm. story and the wheels just fall off the wagon, amenorrheic, all kinds of problems. And I've also seen more women in glycolytic sports like wrestling, judo, jujitsu, where they didn't hit their stride until they went ketogenic. And so I, I, I wish it was as easy as just gender, but I, you, you know, there could be some non-linearity to this where like some females are disproportionately negatively impacted by a ketogenic diet and glycolytic activity. And maybe some females, it's absolutely like the low gear. It is the thing that, that it allows them to succeed. And again, I would be really interested to know the, uh, now the electrolyte status on mm-hmm. these folks, like are the ones that, that fail on this, are they super sweaters? Do they sweat disproportionately large amounts of fluid, which also tends to, to be more sodium rich. And so they're losing more sodium than somebody who isn't, you know, characterized as a super sweater. So it are the signs and symptoms that we see that look like what we would call adrenal fatigue or HPTA axis dysregulation, overreaching, overtraining. Is that a sign of them being sodium deficient? Like, is it, is it hyponatremia that's driving that whole thing. And then the ones that do better are just simply sweat less, or they did better electrolyte management. Mm. Like I, I don't, I don't know. Um, but it, you know, just kind of theorizing around that I, I could argue both ways. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, I think, and that brings me into obviously the subject of electrolytes. I did get a bunch of questions, um, from our listeners on that. Um, so maybe we can dive into, to that. Um, so just in terms of electrolytes in general, um, I know a lot of people are, especially if you've been in the low carb world, keto world, we we know now the importance of electrolytes in a lower carb, um, you know, not 
a diet that maybe if it's it's not even lower carb, but it's a you know paleo mm -hmm. less processed type diet. Um, but what it like specifically? Could you uh, hit on some of like the points of why electrolytes are so important, specifically sodium for just overall? I mean, we talked about training a little bit, but just overall functioning and and op optimizing your your health in general. Yeah, you know, and it, it's funny because I. I consider myself a half decent biochemist and I'm, I'm embarrassed that this topic like was not on my radar for the bed, for the bulk of my career. It, if somebody is placed on a medically supervised ketogenic diet, there is as much attention paid to the protein carbs fat as there is to making certain that the person gets at least five grams of sodium a day, because it's well understood that when insulin levels drop, the hormone aldosterone is downregulated in this production and aldosterone causes us to retain sodium. So we get into this thing called the naturesis of fasting, where when we are fasted or, or just generally experiencing very low insulin environments, we shed sodium like crazy. And, uh, it, it's, uh, it's interesting when you think about if somebody ends up in an emergency room and the individual is unconscious, so we can't, they, they can't relate anything that's going on, even if they're not unconscious, the very first thing that an emergency room doctor is going to look at, the two most important things, arguably, that they consider, other than maybe like oxygen saturation, is pH and electrolyte status. Because if P pH and electrolyte status are so shockingly tightly regulated, if you become a little acidic or a little alkalotic, you, you will either get sick or die. And the same thing is true on that electrolyte story. If you become hyponatremic, if you are low in sodium, it is very, very difficult for the body to write things and get back on track. And, and folks can die from that. We, we see this occur like just about every marathon, every triathlon, people are hospitalized and occasionally even die because they will overhydrate at the, the hydration stations, either drinking straight water or drinking in a, an electrolyte beverage that has too little sodium to offset the sodium losses that they are experiencing. So in a textbook of medical physiology, hydration means water and electrolytes. And when we're really thinking about physical performance, the main electrolyte we need to be concerned with is sodium. Our sweat is not excreting potassium or magnesium. It, it, it's excreting almost exclusively sodium. And, uh, you know, a hard training individual, we've done some work with like NHL professionals and these big guys wearing their gear and they're, they're hot, even though they're skating around on ice, it's hot in there. A big guy will shed 10 pounds of water in a game or a hard practice and 10 grams of sodium. And if they don't do some really amazing work to get on top of that, they will head into a hyponatremic state. And if, if people think back to like their basic physiology and like Krebs cycle, electron transport, all of this stuff is first driven by sodium potassium pumps. Mm -hmm. Every heartbeat we have is a sodium potassium process, you know, creating a, an action potential. Every nerve impulse, every time we we move or talk, it's sodium potassium pumps driving that. And so this is also why if the sodium potassium ratio gets off, we immediately see a decrease in cognitive function, fine motor skill, maximum cardiac output, maximum power production. So like our, our physiology is really tightly wound to being in that, that proper hydration status, which is kind of sodium forward. Uh, potassium is really important. Potassium is a, a, a particular nutrient of interest because there was just a report a couple of days ago that Americans are now consuming two thirds of their calories from purely cr processed food. Like the, it, it, it's been, or what they would consider hyper processed food. Like mm -hmm. it, it is the stuff that, that used to, we barely even looked at as food and that's nearly two thirds of the calories folks are consuming. It is virtually devoid of potassium any type of a whole food based diet, whether it's vegan, paleo, keto, you're going to get adequate levels of potassium. So people get really freaked out about the need for potassium. We actually absolutely need that, but it's mainly an artifact of just eating a completely nutrient devoid diet. The irony is that in a highly processed dietary situation, 
you get plenty of sodium, but you're also getting excess calories and an inappropriate glycemic load and all that type of stuff. And again, I know I bounced around a lot there. No. I'm not sure if I fully answered the question, but it, the sodium is important because it, the, the, in part, if we are adequate potassium, adequate magnesium, with, if we're eating any approximation of a whole food based diet, we should be pretty good on that. But the kidneys do a wonderful job of dealing with the situation so long as we get adequate sodium. If we are deficient in sodium, then the kidneys will begin to bleed off potassium to try to re-equilibrate the sodium-potassium balance because we need more sodium extracellular relative to potassium intracellular. And if we don't have that, we will die because we can't do these action mm -hmm. potentials. Our, our heart won't beat and all that type of stuff. But that begins this downward spiral of shedding potassium shedding water and, and all kinds of bad things mm -hmm. happen with that. Yeah, for sure. So would you say, so you mentioned like within a highly processed diet, you get tons of sodium, but not enough potassium. Does that kind of flip flop when you, uh, have like a non-processed diet? So you don't get enough sodium, but you do get enough potassium. Is that kind of what you were getting at there? Absolutely. That's kind okay. of the irony there. Yeah. 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 And you have crazy. some examples, <laughs> you know, like, a traditional Japanese diet, they, they, you know, uh, fermented foods, uh, soy sauce, things like that, uh, kimchi, sauerkraut, like there are a number of traditional food, um, uh, 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 you know, options that people usually had as condiments to their meal mm -hmm. that were typically very sodium rich. And so I think historically people have had these high sodium sources of, you know, adjacent to their otherwise minimally processed diet. So then they get, they get all the sodium as part of their kimchi or their miso, or, you know, their, their different fermented foods. And then also they're getting plenty of potassium and magnesium and, and the other electrolytes as part of their minimally processed diet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. So I have a few, I guess I, I want to get through some of these questions. So maybe we can kind of do like a rapid fire. I have a few questions rapid fire related to electrolytes, and then maybe we can just end with a few, uh, kind of they're rapid fire. I mean, you could do your best at answering them. Some are very, very broad. Um, but are you, are you down for that? I will do my best, but I <laughs> suck at giving concise answers. Okay. Like I'm terrible at short answers, but I'll, right, I'll well, do my best. All right. Sounds good. Okay. So the first few are related to electrolytes. So someone asked, is there a recommended intake of sodium based off of body weight? No, absolutely not. It, 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 you can use it as a rough beginning point, but are, it, are you living in a hot, humid environment? What is your physical activity level? Uh, are you living at altitude? And it, those things, I would say the physical activity and also the environmental factors are almost a greater determinant than your body weight. Now, a 260 pound male versus 123 pound female, there's going to be some differences there. But the irony is the larger difference is going to come as a consequence of physical activity, uh, heat, humidity, um, maybe some of the things like whether or not they're a super sweater or not. Super sweaters mm -hmm. just sweat more and they tend to uh, excrete higher amounts of sodium. But the most common question we get asked within the element scene is how much should I take per day? And it is the most difficult answer to provide because there's so many variables on that. You know, like, are you mm -hmm. very, very physically active throughout the day? Uh, when we were living in Texas, it was 90 degrees, 90% humidity. We now live in, in uh, Montana at 78 degrees and 13% humidity. And my, my electrolyte needs have subsequently decreased because of living here. So mm -hmm. I would say body weight is, is kind of, you can kind of look at it as a, a rough benchmark, but um, really these other external factors are the bigger, bigger, bigger things to pay attention mm -hmm. to. Yeah. And would you say that would be the same for water intake? Yeah. And, you know, I'm not saying that every gulp of water you consume should have electrolytes in it, but something you should think about. So like the lunch that I had was salami and cheese. I wanted to sit outside. I didn't want a, a big mess. Um, you, you know, uh, uh, just wanted to get some sun. And so that salami provided two grams of sodium. So right now I'm just sipping on plain water. I'm not mm -hmm. adding electrolytes to it because I got my electrolytes as part of the meal. But because I'm going to do some jujitsu later, I'm kind of thinking ahead about what my 
hydration status is and what I'm, I'm going to need. Had I not had a salty meal, I would have done some electrolytes. And so I do think that, it, so this is an important thing to keep in mind. I think that about five grams per day is a bottom floor minimum for most folks. Like if you're not getting five grams of sodium per day, you, if you have lethargy, fatigue, brain fog, and certainly if you're cramping, if you're cramping at all, that is a sign that you're really late stage deficient in electrolytes, specifically sodium. But then the American Council of Sports Medicine suggests that uh, athletes, high motor output, heat, humid, or even altitude, that those folks need at least seven to 10 grams of sodium mm -hmm. per day. And we've seen that it, it may be as much as 50% uh, increased if people are low carb. So we've seen small females, high motor output, hot, humid environment, uh, thriving on upwards of 15 grams of sodium intake spread out through, through the whole day, a mix of both supplemental and also focusing on dietary input. Interesting. That's, that's a lot, yeah. but I mean, yeah. it's a lot, but then when you put it in context, like you just did. Maybe it's not a lot. <laughs> um, it, 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 cool. It's it's new. I think what it is, it's yeah. definitely new. But but it, it's um it's not really that hard to to keep track of, and it, it's very easy to start thinking about some some non supplemental forms of sodium like kimchi or sauerkraut. Olives, ten olives typically provide one gram of sodium. Mm -hmm. So like if you're trying to hit that five grams of sodium per day level, and you do 20 olives at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you're there, you know, yeah. you're, 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 you're totally there. And, and maybe you need a little bit on top of that, but maybe you don't, maybe you took care of it and you got a bunch of antioxidants and some great monounsaturated fats, you know, and, and they yeah. taste really good. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So that brings me to the next question about bloating. So someone asked, um, if I, I noticed that I get bloated or kind of like puffy, if I have too much sodium, can you talk to that a little bit. I know these are really not rapid fire, but <laughs> no, no, I, I like, I would be curious, are they experiencing it in their hands and feet? Are they like, when I hear mm -hmm. bloat, I oftentimes think about like belly bloat. So I would be really curious where they are experiencing it. I think a, it was a like lot of people both. Notice yeah. Maybe both. Like yeah. if you've been out hiking and you've been sipping on water all day and your arms are swinging, your hands swell up and your feet swell up, that is actually a sign of low sodium. It, 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 and you, you are heading into hyponatremia and uh, consuming sodium will actually pull that water kind of out of the places that you don't want it. So some of what people attribute to, you know, that type of swelling is actually low sodium, but then you have like the, the story where you do a sushi bender or pizza bender with some beer and there's a lot of salt and then you wake up and you're just generally bloated the next day. That is a combination, I, I believe, of the hyperinsulinemic process of that meal causing you to retain sodium and water and a high sodium environment. It, it's certainly a, a case that if somebody is eating a highly processed diet and they're insulin resistant and already retaining excess sodium, throwing more sodium into that mix is certainly not going to, going to benefit that person. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes sense. So, uh, two more questions related to electrolytes in terms of potassium, we hear some people kind of fear potassium and supplementing with potassium. Can you chat about that a little bit? Like, can you actually overdose on a potassium supplement? Yeah, you, you, one absolutely can. And it's actually, if you were to look at the LD50, the lethal dose 50, which is what is used in toxicology to determine, basically they take, they use animals for this, uh, could use humans, but the ethics are, are dodgy on that. But you administer a dose of a, a particular substance. And when 50% of that population dies, we call it the LD50. And the LD50 on potassium is, is really very narrow relative to the therapeutic dose. And this is why it's oftentimes challenging to find uh, supplements that are much above say like 90, 95 uh, milligrams of, of potassium. Um, people don't really know or appreciate this. And it's probably good, but like when, when uh, lethal injections are administered, it's actually a form, a form of highly concentrated potassium because it causes mm -hmm. the heart to cramp and, and that's it. And so, the interesting flip side of that is if we overconsume sodium, the kidneys are really, really good at sorting out that problem. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes for most people. 
and the, the kidneys will filter out the excess sodium, uh, put that into the urine, and it's relatively easy to deal with an excess sodium problem, whereas an excess potassium problem can be legitimately dan uh, dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. And so in your formulations, you take that into account because with Element, obviously it's potassium, sodium, magnesium. Um, so that's obviously taken into account because I've gotten some questions like, is this too much? You know, because the sodium bolus is a gram, then that 200 milligrams of potassium is, is generally just fine. Uh, okay. The only people that you would be concerned around any of this stuff is someone like on dialysis or something like mm. that. And they're going to be monitoring their electrolyte levels so tightly that the thought of using some sort of a concentrated electrolyte beverage is not even going to be on their, their radar. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So last question for you, cause I know we're running out of time here. So this is more so just a, a general question for you and kind of goes back to the, when, when we first started talking about like changing your mind about things. So I always try to ask this question at the end, but is there, and I'm putting you on the spot here. Is there anything in the past year, it, it can be anything that you've changed your mind about and why? Well, it hasn't been the past year, but uh, the whole enamorment around fasting and the fear of protein and the fear of mTOR, like several years ago, I abandoned ship on what is kind of the, the mainstream hysteria around that. Like I, mm -hmm. I wrote my first article advocating intermittent fasting in 2005. And by 2006, I deeply regretted releasing it because it mainly went out to CrossFitters and I would get emails and it was like, whether they were male or female, it's like, Hey, so I, um, I intermittent fast 22 hours a day. I eat five grams of carbs a month. I do CrossFit six days a week, but I do make sure to take a day off. And I, I just do a 40 mile muck, you know, ruck march with hot yoga as a cool down. I felt oh good gosh. for a couple of weeks, but then my hair started feeling out. I don't have a libido and I'm cold even in Texas in the summer, what's going on. And I'm like, oh my God, uh you know, <laughs> and, and this hormetic stress that is valuable from some mild calorie restriction or fasting is just taken to massive extremes. And, uh, it's interesting. Peter Atiyah has been a big fan and advocate of, of fasting. And we've had many discussions and I've been really critical of the notion that so long as people are eating adequate protein, not overweight, I don't know if there is any upside or benefit to much of any fasting at all. If you're asking, should you do an additional 72 hour fast once a month or once a quarter, and you aren't already strength training four days a week on a smartly periodized program, then I think you should be focusing on the strength training. If you're not already getting sun on your skin daily, you should be doing that. If you're not drinking some coffee or tea every day, you should be doing that. If you don't have a uh, challenging, interesting social connections, you should be doing that because those are all things that we know correlate better to quality of life and longevity than any notion that a bunch of protein restriction and fasting is going to enhance longevity. And I honestly think it's going to do exactly the opposite. I think mm -hmm. people are fasting to such a degree with this goal of stimulating autophagy that they're burning through their stem cell pool. And when they hit their 60s, 70s, and 80s, assuming they make it to that, they're going to die from multiple system organ failure because this is what we see in animals that are fasted too frequently. The animals die because they no longer have stem cells and they can't repair things anymore. So it, it's uh, overeating is so bad and so deleterious to health that we kind of forget that if you, it, and it's not a trivial thing to do in the modern world, but if you figure out a way of eating such that you are at a phenotype that is consistent with our evolutionary past with like a hunter gatherer type phenotype, you know, males somewhere between eight to 12% body fat, females 12 to 15% body fat, I don't know how much more benefit there is from any amount of like protein avoidance, fasting or anything mm -hmm. else. Maybe doing a little bit here and there is good, but I think strength training, a little bit of cardio, a little bit of high intensity interval training, all of those things, in my opinion, hold much greater promise for health span and possibly lifespan than any amount of, of fasting or calorie restriction. And I am totally... <laughs> 
currently on the in the minority on that, but I've been beating that drum pretty hard. And some some very prominent figures in this space have really been uh, walking back the promise, I think, of of uh, these these fasting interventions. Mm -hmm. And again, we have to contrast if we're talking about an obese individual. Is, is the fasting the benefit? Or if we just simply figured out a way to feed them properly such that they are not overweight, is the fasting going to provide any qualitative benefit above and beyond that? My, my position is probably no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that makes sense. And I think it's just one of those things, like just with keto, fasting, all these things kind of ebb and flow and like really just comes down, everything just comes down to the individual, I think. And it's just trying to, you know, realize too that, and, and I went, down this fasting rabbit hole myself too. And I had to get right back out, but you know, doing more is not always better. Right. So a little bit is good, but then once you kind of tip over into the extremism, it's like, okay, let's, let's dial it back a little bit. So I, I love that. Um, awesome. Yeah, well, it, I have, it, it, yeah, sorry. It, just really quickly, it, it, you know, one of the interesting studies on this is they, so lab bred animals, specifically mice, have been bred for hun a hundred years in a lab environment. And they're across the board obese and really weird genetically. And all of the studies that have been done where they introduce calorie restriction in wild type animals, and particularly if they feed them a, a natural diet, not a processed food diet, calorie restriction kills them early you see no longevity benefit to wild type animals. You don't even see a longevity benefit to animals fed a species appropriate diet. There haven't been many studies done on that, but people are now circling back and recognizing that um, maybe the main artifact that we're seeing is that these lab animals are usually fed an absolute crap diet and all that calorie restriction is doing is feeding them less of a crap diet. But even those mm -hmm. calorie restricted animals are, or what they're doing is they're just looking a little bit more phenotypically like what a wild type animal would look like. They're just not obese. Yeah. Super interesting topic. And I think it, it definitely is something that I want to explore further. So maybe we'll have to have you back on and chat all about that. Cause it, anytime you <laughs> want, I, I would love to. Yeah. And I, I think that a lot of people are, are putting some good effort into things, but I think that they're making stuff a lot more difficult than, and, yeah. and for some really speculative returns. And I, I, I think that as time goes on, I think that the, the enamorment with fasting is really going to disappear. Maybe a very legit strategy for somebody who, somebody who's unwilling to calorie count, somebody who's unwilling to change the macronutrient ratio of what they're eating, but they're willing to eat between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. and eat whatever they want. Awesome. But, but that is simply a method of controlling overeating. It is not something magic be, uh, above mm -hmm. and beyond that. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And the whole, just like the adherence side of things and what works for that individual yep. person. So cool. Yep. Awesome. Yep. Well, do you want to tell our listeners where they can find you anything, you know, exciting that you have coming up that you want to share? Uh, robwolf.com is kind of the main place that, that all this stuff exists. I do a lot of work over at uh, drinkelement.com. So lots of blogging and, and material over there. In theory, I have some social media accounts, but I write stuff up, have my assistant post it. And I, I don't, I unfortunately don't really interact online much anymore because it's just kind of a toxic environment. Every once in a while you get, you'll get me interacting with folks, mm -hmm. but we do have a, an online community called the healthy rebellion. And if you want to actually chat with me directly, that's kind of the place to find me. Awesome. Well, I will definitely link all of that in the show notes. so Everybody can check them out. And yeah, I'm excited to hopefully have you on for, for another one. And thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Huge honor. Take care. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of Metflex and Chill. I hope you enjoyed it. It would be awesome if you could give the show five stars and leave a review on iTunes. We're trying to get placed in the top 100 health podcasts and the five star ratings and reviews are what can help make that happen. I'll add step-by-step -step directions for leaving a review in the show notes. I know it's a big ask, but it really helps. Thanks again. See you next time.